We've seen various timelines of what Lori got up to after the events in 1978. But what about her son John, played by Josh Hartnett in H2O? And I know you've been desperate to find out what Busta Rhymes' Freddy has been up to. Well, back before the David Gordon Green trilogy, and prior to Rob Zombie giving the franchise his unique flair, a continuation was planned that would follow these characters. This would have also seen the return of Sheriff Lee Brackett, as well as an introduction of another franchise first, Snow. So today on What the F*** Happened to This Unmade Horror Movie, we find out what went down with Halloween Retribution. With a dwindling box office, a sequel to Halloween Resurrection wasn't a sure thing after its release in 2002. However, with the franchise's 25th anniversary occurring in 2003, the fandom was hoping for something. Then, with the release of Freddy vs. Jason that summer, Dimension wanted to pit Michael and Pinhead against each other. Thankfully, the Akkads put a kibosh on that idea. But that didn't prevent talks from occurring for several months, with other horror icons like Leatherface and even Jason being bandied about. If you're interested in where that one would have gone, check out our video on it. After the Halloween Returns to Haddonfield convention that took place in Pasadena that year, the Akkads took many questions about a potential ninth film. Fans were lobbying for roles for Danielle Harris, Dick Warlock, and Charles Cyphers, the latter of which got some momentum. But the Akkads weren't entirely sure where to take the series, so they started meeting with various writers. Trancas International Pictures would end up hiring the British writing team of Jim Keeble and Duty Appleton. They crafted a story that would follow characters from past films, while still trying to carve out an identity of its own. Halloween Retribution would have opened up on Halloween night, 1964, exactly one year after Michael murdered his sister Judith. Young Michael is in an almost catatonic state. We're treated to a scene between Loomis and young Michael, but we mostly follow Dr. Hill, who thinks Michael is a lost cause. As a child, Michael steals Hill's glasses. Then, moving forward to October 30th, 1978, we see that Michael has fashioned the glasses into a shiv and attacks Dr. Hill. A familiar station wagon pulls up, and the scene ends. So I guess we now know how Michael escaped the sanitarium. Here, the story moves 25 years into the future, and we follow everyone's favorite survivor, Freddie Harris, as he's on a tour promoting his book, Unmasking the Monster. Which is hilarious because this ends up being a plot point in Rob Zombie's Halloween 2. So we'd eventually see the idea on the big screen. Freddy has embellished a ton and made it sound like he's the sole person responsible for taking down Michael. He's back to being the Freddy that we saw at the beginning of Resurrection. A showman who's just trying to sell a story. Forget whatever character development he had in that movie. During the signing, a mysterious man questions whether Freddy actually killed Michael. This person is eventually revealed to be John Tate, Lori's son from H2O. Then, in a bit of fan catharsis, Freddy is then murdered by the shape after the signing. It's a bit strange, as outside of family, Michael doesn't really hunt down past victims. He's not Freddy Krueger. So the fact that he's hunting down Busta Rhymes when John is still alive is a bit baffling. Though it is explained that John has been hiding out in Europe since the events of H2O. But even still, John is at Freddy's murder, just showing up shortly after. Michael could have killed him then. It also brings up the question as to why Michael targeted Freddy and not the other survivor, Sarah Moyer. I guess Sarah wasn't promoting a book about how she kicked Michael's ass. But the story sees John return to Haddonfield in order to learn more of his mother's past. While looking at the burned down Myers house, he meets Lee Brackett, former sheriff and father of OG victim Annie. Brackett reveals that various ex Smiths Grove's employees are turning up dead, furthering his theory that Michael is still alive and killing. And this is when we get one of the more intriguing elements of the script. It's snowing in Haddonfield. As someone who grew up in Michigan and dealt with many Halloweens with snow, this still manages to be realistic while providing a new environment for the killer. 
And to no one's surprise, Halloween is banned in Haddonfield. So the local teenagers try and do their own Halloween party in the woods. But the snowstorm causes them to take shelter at a nearby abandoned building. And wouldn't you know it, it's the old Smith's Grove Sanitarium. I'm sure you can see where this is heading. Michael has also taken up residence there and starts murdering the teens in various ways. It makes sense to have him there as his old home is burned down. The snow would serve to both trap the teens in the sanitarium, but also prevent help from reaching them. The film gets away from some of the meta elements that were introduced in H2O and Resurrection, and don't worry, we're not getting any martial arts action in this one. Most of the teens are pretty forgettable, but we've got Leah and Noah as our teen leads. Leah is absolutely in the Laurie Strode mold, being a bit of a bookworm. One of the more interesting elements is that Leah is tasked with watching her 14-year-old mute brother, Noah. This allows for Noah to see things, but unable to communicate them with the others. So while he may see Michael Myers early, he can't warn the others. It really raises the tension. We would eventually see John and Brackett show up to save the day. Lee Brackett is one of the best parts of the entire story. He's a broken man after Michael took his daughter from him, much in the same way that Halloween 2018 saw Lori dealing with her own PTSD from those events. We would see Brackett dealing with his own guilt. He feels that he didn't take the threat seriously enough back in 1978. There's also a great moment where Brackett puts on his old sheriff gear, claiming that it'll make him less afraid. And when he and John are in the sanitarium, they come across the murdered daughter of the current sheriff. The parallels cause Brackett to break down briefly, but he still has the strength to confront Michael. It's a wonderful scene given all that Brackett has gone through. The big finale would occur in front of Smith's Grove and on a frozen lake, where John would bury an axe into Michael's chest. The ice would break, with Michael trying to pull John down into the cold depths, but he manages to escape with help from the others. John holds on to Michael's mask as his body sinks into the abyss. This really does feel like a definitive end for the Michael Myers character. Because of this, I'd be very curious to know what the Akkads would ask for in terms of changes. But there is the interesting hint that John will take over for his uncle, with him holding tightly onto the mask with his dark eyes. So maybe the plan was to have John take the reins. It's an element that they hinted at during the end of Halloween 4, and it even shows up in another franchise with Friday the 13th Part 5. So it would have been interesting to see them follow up on it. Because this isn't just some random person from Haddonfield. This is Michael's nephew a worthy successor to the mantle of the shape. And that's not even getting into the Cult of Thorn aspect, which we don't really know if it's in play or not. The script overall is very interesting. There are some dumb elements, like the Myers house being burned down, despite the fact that we can see that it was mostly saved at the end of Resurrection. And they really didn't need to include the flashback, as it only serves to show that Michael was treated badly by the staff. We don't need to sympathize with Michael. That's something we can just infer if he starts going after these people. But the sanitarium allows for a change of scenery that hadn't really been seen in the franchise since part two with the hospital. It's not exactly known why Dimension never went through with Halloween Retribution. It could have been a variety of things. Maybe they were waiting to see if a team up a la Freddy vs. Jason would be the way to go. Or maybe they felt that the recently released Texas Chainsaw Massacre would see an entirely different change in the world of horror. Or heck, maybe it was even Josh Hartnett, whose star was continually on the rise. Whatever it was, it's too bad we weren't able to see this story on the big screen. Getting to see the redemption of both Lee Brackett and John Tate would have been very satisfying. And the ending leaves the franchise in one of the more interesting places that it's ever been in. With the Akkads moving on to Rob Zombie's remakes and then the David Gordon Green Legacy trilogy, the chances of us seeing this in movie form is practically non-existent. But with various unproduced screenplays being made into comic books, this feels like a prime candidate, as it's tense, provides great character moments, and even provides answers to questions that some fans have been wondering for years. 
Like, how the heck was Buster Rhymes one of the only people to survive a Halloween movie? At least we could have wrapped that one up.